Great. Well, I guess we can get ourselves started. Um, so first of all, thank you all for joining us today for African Book Club. My name is Nia McAllister and I'm the Visitor Experience Manager at the Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco. And as we gather today, um, it's essential to acknowledge the times we're living in. MOAD stands in solidarity with Black Lives Matter as there are multiple pandemics killing us, including the ongoing systemic violence against Black people. We honor and mourn the senseless murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Aubrey, Tony McDade, Jonathan Price, and so many others who have lost their lives at the hands of police brutality and racial injustice, including those whose names we do not know. We also stand united with the global movement and SARS in Nigeria, and we mourn the deaths of the peaceful protesters who have been killed at the hands of Nigeria's army and police force throughout these protests. We want to acknowledge that as this list of we will continue to say their names and continue to bring awareness in the fight for real justice for the global black community. I also want to acknowledge the spaces that we're occupying. And though we're gathered virtually, many of us are settlers, immigrants, or descendants of those forcibly brought to this continent. And our institutions were founded upon exclusion, exclusions and erasures of the indigenous peoples whose land we are located on. It is with deep respect that Moad acknowledges that even in a virtual space, our people, our work, and our network servers are all on native lands. And so we thank the indigenous people of the Bay Area and beyond who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. And so I also wanna share kind of the, the overview of today's event. Um, we're really fortunate to have today's author, um, Suleiman Adonia joining us about in about five minutes um, so he'll be here to answer some of our questions. And so the first half of the event, um, we'll get to hear directly from him. And then we'll transition into our, our, our format where it's kind of more open discussion. Um, so generally we ask that everyone please um, keep your microphones on mute unless you are the one speaking. Um, also just out of respect so that everyone feels that they can contribute to this space, please give um, a couple of people in between um, you speaking. So if you speak, at least let one or two other folks um, share before you share again. Um, and Faith will be helping moderate um, the conversation and also um, pass along questions to the author. So at this point, I'd also like to hand it off to Faith um, to, to get us started. Great. Thanks so much, Nia. Thanks, Elizabeth. And thank you to everyone for being here. Um, I'm super excited that we're going to do this. Um, so I think probably the easiest way is I already have questions that I'm going to ask him, but you should feel free to put stuff in the chat. And if you can preface it with like three question marks first, it's easier for me to see what are comments and what are questions. And then I try to kind of combine things, uh, similar questions or questions that might be two part to pass them on to him. If um, I think that I couldn't rephrase it as well as you've asked it, then I'll ask you to unmute and um, pose the question to him yourself. But um, we'll just, we'll start with this first. Um, and usually the author, how much, how much time did he say he was gonna stay with us? I asked him know? here for um, about 45 minutes from 12.15 to one. So okay. we'll see. Terrific. So yeah, that, so that should be, plenty of time um, to get through some of the questions I have and get to the questions you have and then also just give us some time to then talk, uh, you know, gush about him later after he's gone, which we like to do, or or have any criticisms about the book too. It's always great to do that when the author's not in the room. <laughs> so um, yeah, so that should be uh, it. And you can uh, send those questions to me privately or um, put them in the chat. Um, but again, if you put question marks, I uh, preface them, it makes it easier. So that's great. So um, any questions, comments or concerns before he does arrive? Okay, I think something exciting with football is happening in my house. <laughs> that's hilarious. <laughs> That's so funny. Uh, if you haven't, who hasn't been here before, actually? Is there anybody who's a new time? Okay, great. Yeah, it's my new time. First time. That's wonderful. Okay, so um, 
basically it's pretty informal the way Nia has uh, outlined it. We only ask that, you know, you let other people speak. Um, we do discuss the end of the book. You're not required to have read the whole book, but you can't like, um, if we're, if someone's going to bring up something about the end, you don't want to hear it. You can just mute the computer, but there's like nothing, uh, we, you know, we assume that people who come are going to be willing to hear some spoiler alerts, but otherwise you could have not read the book at all. And that's perfectly fine. Uh, we usually summarize it a little bit at the beginning. Um, and maybe we should do that. Um, is there anyone here who hasn't read the book actually? Oh, then I guess we don't need to. So, oh, Yeva? I've read the book. I just wanted to mention one quickie thing is that the book I got had multiple blank missing pages. And I don't know if that happened with any other books or maybe mine was just a weird one, but I've been in touch with the publisher and they sent me, it was sweetly, they sent me, so I was able to do it, but I just wanted to, say it in case that happened to anyone else, get in touch with the publisher, they're very nice about it. So thanks. Okay, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, some people told me they weren't able to get it in time, but I actually found it at the Oakland Library in both audio and, um, and then I had a PDF. But so I'm impressed so many people got it since it is relatively new, it was only published in the US in September. Um, so that's great, not worried about spoilers. Oh, also, uh, some of you don't have your name up on the screen. Um, and if you don't know how to do that, if you hover your mouse on the top right corner of your window, there should be three little dots that allow you to rename yourself. So you can give yourself a name or you can put in pronouns or you can do whatever it is you want to do there. It's available on Kindle. Great. Oh, that's a good point, Peggy. Uh, ask him to do a little reading first. That would be lovely. He is prepared to do that. It's great to hear it in someone's voice. through. Yes, yeah, so and the books are always available through um, Moad's online bookstore bookshop, which is a great way to support local independent bookstores and not contribute to the Amazon behemoth. Okay. Any other questions before we get started? If the author showed up incognito, we didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> That's like my biggest fear. <laughs> I do that to my students all the time. I send them off in breakout rooms and then I like to slide in to see what they're doing. They're like, I don't understand we're supposed to be doing this breakout room at all. It's not clear. Oh, hi, Faith. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have a question as we wait. Yeah, Thomas, come on. Yeah, um, is this an ongoing uh, book club you guys been doing? Is this my first time? Yes. Oh yeah, welcome. Um, yeah, we've been doing it for, um, I founded it about five years ago and then we've been here at Moad for a year, right? It'll be our birthday next month, November. So yeah, every month, uh, this term, it's been the last Sunday of the month. Um, and if you go to our bookshop link, you'll see all the books we've read before. So it's about 40 some titles at this point. Um, so how did you find out about it? Uh, I think I got an email from uh, the museum. Terrific. Yep, all the, uh, thanks, Nia just dropped the link. So then you can see all the stuff that um, we've been reading, which is great. And so we only do oh, thank you. Um, 21st century African literature. So Instagram, yay. Oh, I'm loving that. Excellent. That's where I get all my information too, for everything is on Insta, so, so sad. <laughs> so. <clears throat> so. 
right here. Sit down. So, and every so often we have the the authors come when they can. So we've had a pretty good track record, particularly since moving online. So we usually meet in the evening, but with these folks who are living in Europe, it's easier to move it up to now. Um, I just sent him a, an email, but I'm wondering, Faith, if we want to mm -hmm. just start talking about the book while we're waiting and okay. then, um, you know, he can join when he gets here. Yeah, that sounds great. So, um, yeah, where do we get started? Um, Well, I think one of the things that I'm um, was kind of most uh, that was most noticeable to me is the frank discussion of sex um, and bodies. <laughs> and um, I this morning I wrote read an essay that he wrote about um, the role of the nude uh, in art. Um, and there seem to be a lot of parallels. There are a lot of seem to be a lot of autobiographical elements in his work as well. Um, so it's been very interesting to kind of track down the, <clears throat> the connections, either in his personal biography or in other things he's writing about. But I was wondering how people engaged around the very, very frank use of <clears throat> the body in this text. Pamela, you're muted. I was actually a little, and I'm not usually uncomfortable, um, <laughs> but I was a little bit uncomfortable by the fact that this was a man writing. Mm -hmm. um, it just, it was a little, it, it didn't sit right with me. Mm -hmm. And I have to confess, I stopped reading on page 93. I intend to continue. So maybe that issue would be resolved later in the book. But that was my, it was a very strong feeling I had. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, that's why I think it's, it was very helpful for me to read some of the stuff that he's written about, um, I think, kind of gender fluidity and identity and uh, kind of his female identified upbringing. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's very, it's really interesting. I think it's a really bold and brave thing to do. Could you put those links in the chat so we could avail ourselves of them? Uh, I'm not sure I have I have them as links. <laughs> it's like I pulled out the excerpts into what I have, but um, I can I know what the sources were. I don't have them as links, but I have them as sources and I can put them sources in there. would be great. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, definitely the, the there are two pieces in Granta, um, one of them about nudity. It's like on on what? on writing like Degas paints or something like that. And then there's one on learning to love black skin again. Um, and then a number of interviews, I can't, I can't remember where they were, but um, on not even realizing that he was male when he was growing up because there were so many women in his life. And then seeing how women and girls were treated in the camp and being like, what the what? And so really having that identification which I also think we see with the two characters, the brother and sister, how they kind of blur into each other. Um, so yeah, it's interesting. Oh yeah, thanks, Mia. No fast on those sources. Yeah, Monica. Um, I'm I haven't finished the book. I'm on page one hundred, but I found it actually very refreshing to see such a frank and um, open discussion of or depiction of sexuality, especially around those in adolescence. Right. And I put that in context. I'm, I'm in a playwriting group, play reading group. And we read something, we read a, a play by Octavio Solis that had a real strong sexual current. And it was amazing how we danced around that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it was really refreshing to to see that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely wrestled with my own kind of like, oh, what 
what's happening? What am I comfortable with? What am I uncomfortable with? And why am I uncomfortable? And what might be the purpose of that? Um, so yeah, really very, very interesting. And I think putting it within the context of refugees who are rarely portrayed as full humans anyway, we have this certain expectation of what you need to be to be a professional. He's right here. So he's at the door. <laughs> professional. Okay, you guys, I'm going to let him in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Lyman has entered the room. <laughs> just, a, just a brief uh, comment. I must admit that I had no idea what the gender of the author was. And so I uh, read about like maybe 25 pages and I said, well, this author writes about women, but something is just, I mean, I wouldn't say off, but it's it was just um, different. So I looked up uh, the author's gender and said, ah, he's, he's a man. And I said, well, but is this a gay? Okay? And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. So uh, I just found it uh, right. you know, fascinating, fascinating because uh, yeah, um, the range of se sexual expression and in the context of a camp, I just thought it was really just fascinating. But, yeah. Pretty well done, too. Okay. Hi, how are you, Suleiman? Welcome. <laughs> you're muted. You're, you're muted. I can't hear you. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Wonderful. I'm really sorry. I got confused because in the email, it says nine my time, 15 past nine my time. So I got confused. It's uh, eight past, it's 20 something past eight, my time. Oh. I'm sorry, guys, about that. Okay. Oh, no, no, we're sorry. We're sorry. Um, can we actually uh, spotlight him? <laughs> that would be great. So, um, so welcome so much. I'm Faith. Uh, I'm the host of African Book Club, and you've been talking to Elizabeth and maybe Nia, who are um, my co organizers. And ah, wonderful. And we can see you quite clearly. So, <laughs> Thank you so much. We really appreciate you being here. We already started uh, discussing the book because we're super excited about it. Um, so we have a number of questions, but we are, there's also been a request that maybe you could read a little excerpt too. Um, um, I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> if that's um, you know, I'm not, I haven't been well, so I'm kind of uh, energy wise, I'm really low, but I'll try. Okay. okay. Uh, okay. Uh, would you like to do that now or towards the end when you're feeling more invigorated, perhaps? Uh, yeah, maybe towards the end. Okay. Or, or like in the middle, somewhere in between, yeah. Okay. If you can. <laughs> that sounds great. Okay. Well, thanks for showing up when you've not been feeling well. We really appreciate it. Uh, it's really great for us. Um, so I'll just get started. And if there's anything you don't want to answer, just tell me that that's fine and we can move on to something else. Uh, I know sometimes folks get tired of being asked the same sorts of things. Um, everybody has read at least part of the book. Some people haven't finished it, but um, you should feel comfortable discussing the end. That's not really a problem. Um, and so one of the things that I noticed in a lot of reviews I've read is that your own personal life is quite dramatic. And so reviewers comment on that, that your own life seems like the stuff of novels and that there are these many parallels between your own personal experience and then things that work their way into the novel such as fleeing Eritrea after the 1976 massacre, living in a refugee camp, witnessing sexual violence against women and children. Um, and then I read that as a teenager you and your brother received asylum in England and moved to London without having a word of English and that's just fascinating. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about your journey to becoming a writer. Oh my God. Okay. Um, um, uh, so first of all, uh, thank you so much for having me. It's, um, I'm really happy to be here because uh, I really didn't want to cancel the event. So I'm really glad I could make it and thank you so much. Mm. Um, it's, it's not easy question to answer because um, it's, you know, um, I don't, come from a background that is kind of literary background. I don't know if you have something like that, but nevertheless, for example, um, 
both of my parents uh, couldn't read and write. And I was, you know, I spent like eight years in uh, two Sudanese refugee camp as a child, and we didn't have books or libraries. Uh, and so I wasn't, I didn't know what literature or books were at that time. And then when we fled to, oh, when we went to Saudi Arabia when I was 10, um, literature was something dangerous because most of the novels were banned because, you know, uh, the situation in, in Saudi Arabia. And so for me, the idea of uh, reading, it was all about taking risk because um, what, what we did was uh, my brother befriended a Sudanese intellectual who was himself a smuggler, but also who knew other smugglers of literature. And so I was like 12, 13, and I was reading banned novels. And our library was under our bed, uh, the bed that my brother and I shared. Mm. Um, and so, you know, so for me, literature was a risk taken. So in that sense, I don't really have, I wasn't introduced to it in a kind of very beautiful way, in, you know. Um, and then I came to London and for so many years, I didn't read any books because I just couldn't afford it. Um, um, I, you know, I was, I came when I was 15, 16 and my brother was also young and we didn't have any family. So, uh, and I was given something like 17 pounds a week to live on. And, and that was ridiculous. You know, I was, I was totally starving <laughs> because, you know, uh, out of that 17, I was meant to buy my transport, my food, medicine. And, and so, you know, I didn't have enough income to buy books. Mm -hmm. And so, again, it was all about finding an alternative way to literature mm -hmm. um, and another or a different way to literature. And, you know, reading came into my life really late. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why I always think like... Um, you know, when I hear, for example, a lot of novelists say to, you know, um, when they advise young writers and the first thing they say is read, read, read. I think we don't realize how uh, of a privileged position that is. Yes. Uh, and that's why I always think like when I, you know, encounter young writers, I always tell them if you don't have the ability to read, mm -hmm. then you have to find other ways to learn. And, you know, we can read the air, we can read nature, we can read music, painting. And so, and that's why, that's my path to literature. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's a different path. Uh, and so, yes, I have to kind of uh, find my own way, if you mm. see what I mean. I love that. I love that. That's great. And it's very empowering to take it outside of the privileged idea of having this massive library. So I love that you say that that way. Um, it seems like there is a lot of um, art and storytelling in the book, though. I mean, we open with the idea of the, you know, the cinema silencio. There are these photographs or not unphotographs. Um, and then I, I really resonated with the idea of oral storytelling as a way of resistance and hope and the idea of the mother sending home, uh, sending tapes back. So even though she couldn't write, there was this, you know, telling stories and taking care of her children, which I understand is also an autobiographical element. So I was just wondering if you could speak to the role of the arts and storytelling in the book. Um, I think it's, um, you know, it's, it's, again, this is quite uh, um, related to your first question. Mm -hmm. And again, I seem to kind of raise eyebrow all the time when I say like, oh, you know, one of or two of my early literary influences were my mother and my grandmother, mm -hmm. and both were illiterate. And, you know, people expect you to mention, I don't know, Beckett or Joyce or <laughs> things like that. And, uh, you know, I appreciate those writers, but at the same time, I can't deny, for example, my grandmother. Well, you know, when I lived in the camp, I grew up with my grandmother because my mother left the camp to Saudi Arabia to work when I was, a ch when I was about three. Uh, and, and she used to tell us all those kind of stories that they were so powerful in their imagery. And, you know, and that's when I think, like when I always think about the, um, the rich imagery in my prose, if I can say so, because I, I do know my strengths. Yeah. Um, and I think it, it comes, it's kind of rooted 
on how my grandmother used to tell the stories. You know, things like, for example, um, I know I mentioned this before, but like one of the stories that I still remember was about this woman who fled in um, uh, at her wedding night and she was wearing white and, you know, and so this idea of this woman wearing white dress, you know, uh, escaping through the night and darkness, it kind of stayed with me. Um, again, with my mother, for example, um, uh, so my mother is illiterate and at the time was well, she couldn't read and write. But so when she lived in Jeddah, she is instead of asking men uh, to write her those letters, she would um, she would record her letters herself in tapes. And she was so, so descriptive yeah. about the place where she lived, um, you know, and and it was just like it made me kind of you know, when after hearing her tapes and I would walk around the camp, I could visualize where she lived, you know, and her description was so powerful that I could really immerse myself in the details of her life. And it was really strange because when I moved to Jeddah and I would walk around the palace where she lived and I was just like in awe, like how accurate she was with her description. And so those were two kind of elements that really resonated with me, I suppose, as a, when I myself became a storyteller mm -hmm. and I have imported those power, you know, the, 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 the powerful voices of these two women into my work. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And yeah, and you're known for your really strong imagery. So it sounds like, you know, when you say read music, read nature, um, and growing up that way, imagining things that it's really made its way into your work. It's lovely. Um, you mentioned your, your mother leaving and I've read that that's the moment when you became silent and in the book you actually thank your grandmother for allowing you to be quiet. And I was wondering if you could talk about the title, both how it functions in the book around the types of silence we see, but also in your own life when you choosing silence as the mother tongue. Um, you know, the, the funny thing about this title is that it came to me really so late into writing the book. I mean, when I started, I I think it was about eight years from starting the novel and I was taking, you know, I love walking at night and there's this particular uh, place um, where we have like two ponds and I just love to go and sometimes sit there at night. And, uh, and, and so like I was walking there at night and I just somehow this title came to me and it was silence is my mother tongue. And I remember running back home and kind of writing it down. And I thought to myself, this is the title. Um, for some reason, I've been so patient with the title and it just <laughs> dropped, you know? Uh, and, you know, it's only that afterwards it came to me, it was there and it just, it needed kind of the right moment, the right place, the right, um, the right feeling within me to kind of grasp it actually. And it's, you know, and, it, and it's true because it's, it's, that's how I was as a child because, um, you know, so I was, like I said before, I was three when my mom left and I didn't want to talk, you know, and it's, it's really weird because you know, it's almost like, uh, you know, um, to have a mother tongue, you kind of need a, the physical presence of a mother and so with her departure, almost like it felt the language kind of started to fade. And, and I kind of didn't want to speak. And, and, you know, I just loved being silent, you know. And, um, and my grandmother kind of understood the silence, but no other people around me because they thought like at the time uh, that only girls were supposed to be silent, you know. And um, they thought like as a boy, you really have to speak all the time. And that's how we, I guess your, your presence, you make your presence felt through your voice, through speaking as a boy, you know? And I remember they wanted to take me to a doctor because to somehow rescue me while it's so funny. While now all I do is like, you know, and sometimes I wake up at night and just, I crave silence. Oh, wow. <laughs> so interesting. <laughs> Well, I'm Nigerian and no one is supposed to be silent. They would definitely take you to a doctor if you were talking I know, at the time. I, know. I mean, it's Africa, right? It's yeah. Quite, uh... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Interesting.
interesting. Um, well, that makes me want to then talk a little bit about structure. As a, a writer, I'm fascinated with structure, and I've seen some reviews that say the structure kind of performs the fragmentary nature of trauma and memory. Um, and so I'm interested in kind of how, if you thought about structure or if you found it just coming out in that way, and also what then was the internal process of trying to write about things that might have had a traumatic resonance as well? I think that's an interesting question because um, initially anyway, I remember wrestling with the structure, but I remember wrestling with the whole idea of what a novel is and how we should write it. Mm -hmm. And the, the concept of a novel itself, in my mind, it had to kind of um, um, adhere to certain rules. Mm -hmm. And those were the rules that we know, you know, the, I don't know, the six or seven rules, show, don't tell, <laughs> this, that, right. and including the kind of, <laughs> you know, the narrative arc. Uh, I can tell you stories with agents and blah, blah, what happened to me and a uh, narrative arc, <laughs> but that's for another time. <laughs> but uh, and then I, I think it, it just happened to me that I suddenly realized I was actually, be, I was working beyond the rules of those kind of what a novel is, you know? And I just felt like I really wanted to write the novel how it came to me without paying too much attention, you know, uh, to this rule or that rule. And that's why I know as a writer, you're not supposed to talk about some reviews, but I found the New York Times review of my book fascinating. It almost felt like, the, the reviewer was just sitting with this uh, rule of literature as he was reviewing my book. And I was thinking, I'm really beyond that. You know, I really couldn't care less about uh, show or don't tell. For me, what matters is how I feel when I write the story. And what matters to me is how the power of the story that comes from within you. And, and that's what really matters. And that's what I live um, to make sure that I speak the truth of the characters, how we speak them, it's sometimes you can tell and you don't probably show. And sometimes you can, you know, you can have a fragmented nature or sometimes you don't. It's just really, I pay attention to, to, to the world of my characters and nothing else. Mm, wow, I love that. <clears throat> well, let's, let's continue to talk about this rule breaking because it seems as though the, it's not just the structure, but it's also, um, the subject matter uh, we were, you know, talking before you came about kind of the, the frank um, engagement with female pleasure and bodies and sex. And then there's also all the, the breaking of gender rules and expectations. Um, and it seems to me that this is doing really important political work, which is making the refugee as a label, an actual individual that we don't normally see in literature. Um, so anything you want to say with regard to General um, agency. I think, you know, I, I think it's really important, again, like if you, for me anyway, it comes to this idea that society really wants to, to strict, to restrict writers within certain rules, but I think they want to restrict humanity itself within, mm -hmm. you know, within a very kind of rigid uh, uh, nature of existence, you know? Um, and I think it's not about, I don't live, I mean, I'm not a rebellious in any way because I just think I live my life the way I think I want to live it, you know, mm -hmm. truthfully. And I think that's the way I write. It's, you know, it comes from within. It's not something I go and I kind of wave it as, a, as my flag and, and say like, okay, this is me, this is kind of, I'm rebellious writer. I mean, I wasn't thinking about, for example, when I was a child in, Saudi Arabia and my brother and I were walking with band novels. I wasn't thinking <laughs> like, oh my God, um, I'm this kind of like uh, danger, thrill seeking person. I'm just like, you know, I just wanted to find literature that wasn't just about black and white and how the society wanted me to read, you know? I wanted, I followed my brother, he was my hero. He mm. was someone who took risk and I just wanted to kind of I thought to myself, my brother is the path I want to follow, not the Saudi teaching, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's to me with the whole idea of gender, you know, we, we have all those rules. And I was thinking about it, obviously, when I was writing the novel and how, you know, and how we're all supposed to live within those boxes and what happens 
what happened was at the time is that my characters were like jumping out of those boxes and they were kind of going into different boxes. And I, that kind of enlivened me and energized me. And it made me think like, that's why I love writing, you know? I love writing because, you know, I, I follow those characters and I live their life truthfully. And some, some of the things that made me do were quite crazy, but, you know, it's, it's, it's worse. I mean, I would go through it all over again because for me, the, the, the process of writing this book was really torturous. But at the end of the day, um, it's liberating as well. And, and that's why I always say like, yes, I wrote the book, but actually the book rewrote me as well. Mm, rewrote you as well. Amazing. Absolutely. I mean, you know, it's just about, you know, it's about, I think um, the thing with, I guess with writing is you have to admit, or I admit it's, there's a lot of, you know, giving yourself in the process. And so there's a lot of fragility. There's a lot of vulnerability. And I think when you when you kind of embrace that kind of vulnerability and fragility and you open your chest, and that's when the words come out from within you, but also they leave traces of I don't know, scar of happiness, and you know, and then you slowly begin to discover like how rich your body is in absorbing all those different elements, and you know, and you you know, there's no point. Uh, at no point do you think, okay, I'm a man, I have to stick, or a, a woman. Uh, I don't know, you know, it's just, it's the freedom. That's what I want to say. Mm, the freedom, that's interesting. Can, can you speak a little more about that in the context of gender? Because I think, you know, in Africa in particular, gender roles are so important. Um, and it's one of the things that this book is challenging. But then there's also, there are these expectations in the literary world of who gets to write about what. And so it's, you know, I'm sure people have told you that you're really brave to write about, you know, to write about girls or to write about female pleasure or to um, have these characters who are kind of challenging these norms. Um, and it seems to me that this is important to what you're doing about what you're saying, but I've also read some things you've said just about how you were female identified. And I'm really interested just in this conversation of fluidity and what you're doing with, with gender here. Um, I think, um, I think, you know, it's, um, it's, it's about, I think it's more about, um, obviously I, I think I was lucky in a way that I was, brought up in Sudan, uh, especially when I was in Sudan, in a compound surrounded by women, you know? Um, because um, you do kind of learn. I mean, when I think back to those days, you kind of really observe how the society works mm. and it does its work in terms of expectation of you as a, as a boy or a girl, expectation of you as a woman or man, and how it kind of function in the way it kind of restricts you. Mm -hmm. And obviously that's, that's patriarchy and, and you kind of, I, I, knew, I, I think what I'm trying to say is, I think when I was young, I really wanted to be my grandmother, you know? She, <laughs> I, I wanted to embrace the world through her eyes. You know, I wanted to see the world through her eyes. And I think I, in a way I did, especially when I was a child, I think I did see the world through her eyes and I felt to myself, this is the world I want to continue to see, you know? Mm. Uh, and then you come into the world of men when we went to Saudi Arabia, for example, it's gender segregated society. So I found myself in a world of men mm. and, and suddenly it was mm. alien to me, you know? Mm -hmm. And I could function and I didn't know how to function in that world. And it just felt like, um, it's almost like, I don't know, uh, taking a fish, I think that's a bad example, but you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, you're just putting me somewhere where I felt I didn't belong 100%, you know? And, and it just, so, you know, I kind of, but in a way it's really, it was good, a good experience because I got exposed to, to the kind of, uh, to the ugliness of patriarchy from within, you know? Um, 
obviously I was very privileged to be a boy in, in Saudi Arabia, but at the same time, I think you kind of begin to realize and study the world and you realize what the fuck is wrong with the world and you see it within, you know, you see it is there, you know, it's basically men and the rules they create, which mm -hmm. oppress, them, you know, and so, you know, I felt like really suffocated and, and, and it's, um, and so I think the more comfortable, the more I started writing, the more comfortable I felt with those voices and the more comfortable I felt kind of embracing those different characters or giving them the space in my, in my world to be who they are. And I think it's really important when you write about gender, be it a woman or a man, is actually to, to kind of elevate yourself from you as a person. And you kind of, you begin to, to transcend and you're operating from a different zone mm -hmm. that you don't know if you're a man or a woman, but mm -hmm. what you know is that you are a writer. And I think that's when the true writing, I don't know if that's such a thing I can say, but that's when writing felt um, truthful to me. Mm. Awesome, it is. Thank you. Thank you for that. Mm. Are you interested in reading for us? Um, Okay. Oh my God. <laughs> See what uh, I did here? <laughs> uh, I, I can't get out of it. So I'll, I'll try. Uh, so um, I just open a page and it's there. Uh, so this is, I think I'm, I'm going to start reading from the early, uh, I think it's the opening chapter of the book. It's about, um, from Jamal, and uh, you probably know who Jamal is by now, so <laughs> no, no introduction needed. Uh, so this is just, you could, uh, you know, uh, let me stop myself because people tell me, uh, I want you to read because I want to hear the kind of uh, writer's uh, voice, but you know, on yeah, I felt like when I wrote this book, it took me 10 years to write. And I felt like, the, you know, I had no voice in terms of my own voice. And mm. so this, and that's why I always try to avoid to read it because I feel like, um, you know, um, me and the book are totally different oh, wow. or it felt we were in different zone. And it just feel like I'm, I'm just like you, a reader when I read it, you know? So. Uh, yeah. Just bear that in mind. <laughs> uh, so here you go. Um, and for a long time, before I had inherited my hat from a man who, who had drowned in the river, I slept in different hats and laid my head on the same pillow as a poet, a rapist, a widow, an adulterer, a fantasist, an uncompulsive flyer, an imam, a homosexual, a priest, a closet transvestite, a man who molested his son, mother who beat her children until her rage was engraved on the skin. And for a while, I dwelt with a young widow who spent her nights parked on the ground of her hut on all fours, surrendering her naked body to the ghost of her deceased husband. So I went to bed with the smell of her yearning sex filling my lungs. These people's dreams, their fears and crimes became mine. I lived wondering whether I would end up a dreamer a wanderer between countries and lovers, or someone who would walk, who, who would stalk a victim through dark alleyways, or whether I would be a man of words, or even be transformed by the might of the divine into a woman like Saba, whose moonlit, moonlit flooded curves I had pictured as my own. Mm, wow. Thank you so much. I hope you're happy now, Faith. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I was yeah. doing this, for, I was asking on behalf of the other people. <laughs> oh my God. I think, you know what? I think this should, one of them should have read actually, that would have been fascinating for me to hear. I, right? But, I, I always suggest that to my students. I'm like, do you want someone to read your manuscript out loud? And they want, never want to give that control up. So, but I'm like, it's a gift to hear someone else read it. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> I, would, I would love, I always love it. So sometimes I go to kind of, um, to events and I always ask people and some of them are like, you know, hesitant, but when they read it, they kind of feel like, oh yeah, I'm part of, you know, the whole setting and set up and the whole thing. Yeah, it's a great thing to offer people. That's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, I hope I haven't traumatized you too much. <laughs> no, 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 you haven't. You haven't at all. Like, I'm done now. So I'm in a happy place. <laughs> yes, that's over. <laughs> so um, I wanted to follow a little up on what, what how you were saying when you talked to uh, young writers um, about, you know, whether they, they can do other things besides just reading books, because um, well, I, I read that you have this project teaching creative writing to refugees and asylum seekers in Brussels, which I think is amazing. And um, I do a little of that when I'm in Finland and the, we encourage refugees to write in their own, in their native tongue. But when I'm in the US, we're always trying to get people to learn English and, and fit the publishing world here. So just, and, and we have this thing about like, we will write, we will give voice to marginalized groups and we won't really, allow folks to kind of find their own voices. So I'm just really interested in kind of what, how you, how you do that work and then how you teach folks to advocate for themselves. If someone says you don't have the narrative arc or you're not writing in the colonial language, like how do, you know, how do you take what you've learned and pass that on to folks who are writing their stories? Um. Thank you for asking that. I think it's um, it's quite an interesting question, actually, because um, um, for me, I think the issue always been about we have one idea, you know, um, being a refugee itself is a label. And so you have one idea about people, like whether they're refugees or immigrants. So you assume like everybody who, um, who happens to be a refugee or immigrant, they're all the same. And I think obviously I've been a refugee in three different continents. Uh, and so I'm kind of used to that label. And, you know, and, you know, I, I really embrace it. I have, you know, I've been, I opened my eyes with the, with the label of a refugee in a refugee camp, you know? So that's why I talk about a refugee camp as someone, I don't know, from New York or London would talk about their London or city, you know? I talk about it with love and pride. Um, yes, it was in a place, you know, it was a quite difficult place to live, but it also was my childhood place, a place where, um, you know, I lost my childhood friends, but also it's a place where I gained the, um, I was introduced to the, I think, to the concept of pure love, you know? Um, and you know, and, and so throughout my life, I just didn't really find myself as someone voiceless because I was brought up by people who were very proud, Eritrean, who even though they were stateless, they, they were kind of very strong about their own identity, you know, by a, a grandmother who was powerful, who was fighting patriarchy every day, who was fighting for us, for herself. I mean, you have no idea the kind of fight she had, she was involved as a child and the pride I would see, for example, when men, they would say, oh, what do you expect of those children who were brought up by a woman? And then she would go and fight them. And how proud I used to be of her. Um, <laughs> that, you know, I come from that background where no one in my life was voiceless, you know? Um, so I don't expect other refugees to be voiceless. You know, I really detest that terms. Like when people say that I am the voice for the voiceless, it's not about that. And that's what we do in this creative, Writing Academy for Refugees and Asylum Seeker is that we just give us um, a safe space for all of them to come and do the story they want. And so the, the always on the first day, I would say to them, I always talk about freedom or we talk all of us about freedom and what it means to us. And, you know, and, you know, we, yes, we do talk about the rules, but with the point of view that they will own the rules and if they want, they can add to those rules or, you know, or kind of subtract of those rules and do their own work. That's the most important thing. Wonderful. And, you know, you'd be surprised. I mean, the kind of stories that we've had, like, you know, we just had like one memoir and the, the entire, like, you know, the, the kind of rest of the, the other stories were like science fiction, uh, um, I, I don't know, stories about really spectacular stuff, uh, um, and beautiful as well. And, and so, you know, I'm, I am there and my co-tutor, because I always make sure that we two people who teach the course, mm -hmm. uh, we are there just to support them to, you know, and to, to kind of guide them th through the kind of um, the, the, 
through the stories that they've chose to read, to write because the idea and the way they write the story always rests with them. Um, and then I make sure like I work really hard to make sure that they also have the opportunity to perform their stories. And so they've always been part of uh, literary festivals. And I always make sure also to kind of put them in touch with uh, established writers who could uh, mentor them. And I was very proud when one of my um, students have been, um, uh, you know, chosen by a residency. Uh, and, you know, he wrote this beautiful story and he's working on his book with a uh, established Belgian author. Um, you know, it's, it's, we, we sometimes don't have money. We do it just us, you know, we just get together and, you know, it's it just, we, it's all about trying to limit the limitation and try to find the richness, uh, a space for the richness that we all have. And, and that's what we do um, where, with this course. That's fabulous. That sounds really wonderful. Thank you for doing that work and for letting us know about it. It's really great to hear about. We have a few people who'd love to read to you if, you, <laughs> if you'd like oh, to hear. <laughs> you know, today's like the birthday of my novel, actually. It's been two years. So oh, thank right. you. So, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's it's been two years. Yes. Um, so it's uh, what you're doing is a gift to me, for me, and for the book. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so who's going <laughs> to... So we have Uzi, uh, Nia, and Yeba want to read to Suleiman on his book birthday. <laughs> oh, my God. Thank you very much. Okay, so who's up? I guess, I guess, I guess, I guess Yeva has, has nominated me. I was hoping to go last. <laughs> <laughs> this is like bringing up, uh, you know, sixth grade terror of like popcorn reading. <laughs> um, okay. This is on page 98 and I hope it's not too long, but it was one that stuck out to me. Um, the girl with plaited hair and a cross tattooed on her forehead stood in front of the heavily built man she was accused of seducing. The man turned away from her and ran to his wife in the audience. Forgive me, he said to his wife, surrounded by their children. The judge ordered the man to come back. And when he did, the girl's mother rushed forward and screamed, my daughter did not seduce this man, he raped her. But the girl's father scurried toward his wife and slapped her. It's your fault for letting her wear this. Against his body, he held the dress his daughter wore that night. Just look, he said. On the instruction of the judge, the girl was taken away to a nearby hut and returned wearing the dress, which barely covered her knees. The judge read out a statement with a verdict. Impurity will be rooted out from this camp. We will not allow this wilderness to corrupt our souls. This girl will bear her sin on her back. The man climbed on the back of his seducer and the girl trudged around the square carrying the man, her sin, an adult double her size. The girl's back bent, yet Saba noticed she didn't flinch. She didn't wince. Girls, she, she thought, are used to carrying things, firewood, water, food, for their families, their brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, as well as themselves and their own sorrows. No amount of weight can crush a girl. But Saba also knew that this girl's real punishment was the reputation inflicted on her. From now on, she would be confined to the back room of life, to a place where she would be forgotten, like the building left alone to decay. So that when a man drove past and sought shelter in her body, as a last resort in his drunken hour, he would find her infested with rats, bats, spiders, mites. This girl, Saba thought, would be a moral ghost story for generations to come. Oh. Wow. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. That's beautiful. <laughs> That's Thank amazing. You. Wow. Okay, I'm going to jump in because I want to listen to, to um, 
Mia, yeah. you you get the treat for that for before and after. Any page could have been fine. I'm reading from page 122, and there's so many pages. Mother said, Sama, I am sorry I am not the kind of daughter you always wanted to have. I never will be. Saba left to go back to work. When she stood in front of Naznet, her boss said, you smell as if you've been cooked in chili. What happened? Silence. Have they found out you were working for me? Silence. They did, didn't they? Saba sat in front of the bucket. No, you are not working today, said Nesnet. Here, come inside and take a shower. Saba did not move. Come, said Nesnet, please. Saba gave her hand to the woman who led her inside the hut where only men had been. Saba cast her eyes around. To the left of the door, there was a pale blue plastic chair lined up against the wall. Right next to it, under the window, stood a small table. Covered in colorful fabric, it was arranged with a set of china cups and silk flowers in a blue plastic vase. Further, next to the tape recorder, on top of an upside down sardine box, there was a slim wardrobe, and next to that, the bed. For Saba, a bed had up to now been a place to sleep, study, and dream. Here, it had a different purpose altogether. She looked away. Come on, get ready, Nesnet said, setting off to prepare the bath. She rolled up a jute rug and lined it up against one side of the hut and drew out a large washing bucket from under her bed. Placing it by the pole, Nesnet then strode out of the hut. Saba's eyes darted around the hut again. The amount of furniture made the hut smaller, but the decoration and color reminded her of when she was in her own room back home. Nesnet returned with scented soap, shampoo, and a pail with water, which she placed next to the washing bucket. She gasped. Pressing a hand to her chest, Nesnet asked, my God, Saba, what happened to your thighs? Nothing. Saba lowered herself into the bucket. I'm sorry, Nesnet said, hugging Saba close. Saba sank into her friend's embrace, closing her eyes. I'm fine now, but they wanted to silence me head to toe, shut my mouth and cut off the lips of my vagina, but I am still talking. Nesnet's tears fell. I am sorry, she said to Saba. Maybe I shouldn't cry, but I can't help it. Saba smiled. Come on now then, give me a bath. Oh, thank you so much. Oh my God. <laughs> Love the book. Wow, thank you. Wow. That was wonderful, great. Um, well, I know we're getting towards beyond the time we said we were gonna have you. Do you have time for one more? Uh, yes, please. Okay. <laughs> yes, yeah. I'm loving this, really. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> Great. Mia? <laughs> I'm going to read a quote, a passage from page 30. Also, this is just an honor to be able to read <laughs> to you. This is really fun. Right. <laughs> Saba staggered out of the hut. Streaks of orange light appeared on the horizon, as curved as the humps of a camel. Footsteps shuffled across the sandy ground. A figure emerged from a narrow passage into the square. The man stopped in the middle of the square, placing the oil lamp he was carrying on the ground next to him and creating a circle of radiance around his feet. He announced the call to the first prayer of the day. No one answered. The man waited, arms folded, dust covered his sandals. Without his turban, his gabi, his robe, his rug, without a minaret, a dome, four walls, a direction of prayer, the imam's authority, Saba thought, was left in the lean and tall silhouette of his shadow printed on the bare grounds of the camp. He called for the prayer again and again. His voice grew hoarse, no response. 
He soon fell silent. He dug his foot into the sand and dragged it along, beginning to outline a place of worship. He stopped and looked back. The faint outline behind him grew dimmer as he marched onwards with his oil lamp. He returned to the starting point and began all over again, a hardened fighter refusing to give up a battle despite losing his armory. That thought came to Saba as she walked towards him and followed his outline, digging her foot harder and deeper behind him, marking human presence in this wilderness. The Imam lifted his lamp. Her face glowed in response to his smile. He coughed. He regained his voice. This should be big enough, he said after a while, but we can expand it if needed. After all, it is a line in the sand. Where is the direction of prayer, Saba asked. Mm -hmm. Imam raised, his, raised the hand with the oil lamp high against the sky. Rays of light poured from his high arm. God is everywhere, he said. The mosque in the sand was completed. Saba skipped back to her hut as if she had participated in the construction of a real mosque that would last beyond her life on earth. The thought, though, made her shiver. What if life in the camp ended up being only as firm as that line in the sand? Mm. Wow. 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 Thank you so much. Amazing. Oh Thank God. you. I was crying with that one. <laughs> um, really, I'm overwhelmed and I feel very, very emotional, very touched. And um, yeah, I didn't expect this. So thank you very, very much. It's a beautiful. <laughs> really my pleasure that was so wonderful that was so wonderful so thank you so much for spending time with us um i don't know if how <laughs> what we want to do at this point <laughs> um i yeah go ahead no no I'm, I'm i don't know what time it is my kids are eating i know they're waiting for me but yeah. um you know i i um if you have any question for me, one or two is fine. Uh, I would be very happy to answer. Okay, wonderful. Um, I tried to combine or fold in any questions I saw in the chat as I was able to go along. Is there, is there anything else? Oh, so um, Pamela is asking what, what you're working on now. <laughs> you always I, saw, that one. <laughs> I, I saw that flashing uh, <laughs> and I was like, uh, go away, go. <laughs> no. uh, um, I don't know. I don't know what to say because um, all I can say is I'm I'm really feeling good about what's coming um, because you know um, I think I struggled for a long, long time to write silence. Uh, yeah that I really feel the energy, I feel the confidence now of, you know, my voice, my writing style, and all the things that I've mentioned before about, you know, when and how to break a structure or, you know, I think, no, I think I should say this. I, I feel confident that I would definitely 100% write the story that has to be written regardless of anything else. And so for me, I think uh, the, Silence is my mother tongue has, I think the biggest uh, lesson it taught me how to submit myself or, or whatever skill I have to, to, the, to the power of the story. And, and I've, I know, and so I feel really good. Something is coming up hopefully soon and I can't wait and, you know, to share with you and I'm feeling at, you know, the right place and yeah. And, Hopefully I'll share with you more soon. Wonderful. Well, we'd love to have you back. This has been really wonderful. Yeah, please have me back. I'd love to, yes. <laughs> and we won't wait 10 years though, okay? <laughs> no, 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 no. Actually, you know, it's, it's, almost, it's almost done. It's almost done. So no, I mean, you know, no, no. That's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm feeling very, very good. I'm feeling very confident and I'm feeling ready. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's great. <laughs> Everyone's very enthusiastic about that. So um, 
I feel like that's really a good ending. I mean, there are some small questions here. Uh, people are asking about how you got the idea of cinema and how you, how, when you're silent, were you listening to everybody else or do you just tune out language in general? Um, um, you know, um, I think I'll, I'll quickly answer both of them. Okay. Um, well, the thing is about silent, I mean, um, I, I basically write in cafes most of the time, um, but I do a lot of thinking at night when I'm by myself, um, when I listen to music, when I dance by myself, you know, through, when I was writing Silence, I went through really, really like, I mean, I've been insomniac my entire life, but with Silence, it got really bad. But, you know, I was at 3 a.m. in my living room, dancing, listening to music, to Cesare Evora, or, you know, classical music, opera, <laughs> or jazz, or, you know, hip hop, all these kind of different things. And, you know, and, and yeah, and, you know, so, I mean, silence is stages, you know, and you really learn which stage you are at slowly, you know, the more you kind of, you live with it at night, especially. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of the cinema, you know, um, I I think I mentioned earlier like how we didn't have books uh, when I was growing up in a camp. But what we did have is that when we used to go and visit the city, uh, we used to go to cinema. So I was first introduced to cinema actually before literature, and you know, and 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 that's I think where that kind of idea originated from. Like you know, just. It, it just happened, I came up with the idea. I think sometimes we we live with things we care about for so long. Uh, and I think that's what art is. Art is about those beautiful moments where you kind of, you know, you're living with something like book, a book or like nature, you're walking in nature and then suddenly your imagination is working as working without you noticing. And then suddenly it comes up with something. and. I think that's where the idea of cinema came. I really have no idea its origin, but I know that my imagination was working or I was working on my imagination, you know, uh, through all this, uh, yeah, throughout, you know, many years. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ace. Thank you, everyone. Thank ah. you so much for the time and for the gift. And I, yeah, I really appreciate it. That was lovely. That was lovely. Happy, happy book birthday. <laughs> Thank you. Peace, everybody. <laughs> Cheers, everybody. Yeah. Ciao. <laughs> Bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs>
yet succinct images is really feels like an incredible gift. Yes, yes. Thank you. Yeah, I also think that as well, as far as I think, um, so I was also raised by my grandmother. Hmm. Um, and so the writing made sense to me as far as how he was able to kind of, how she was able to kind of speak through him. Uh -huh. And I think that's where that kind of wisdom and kind of succinctness that, you know, elders have a way of packing things. You know, African tradition is also really obsessed with speaking in parables, right? And those parables are really vivid and, you know, but, but they're less than a cent, they're like a sentence long and you spend forever trying to unpack these things. <laughs> I know. All right. What? what did she just tell me? Yeah. Yeah. And I think my favorite character, well, there's only one character that made me cringe and which was uh, the businessman's son. Uh, right. But my favorite character was the grandmother and she only had like a couple pages towards the end of the book where she was in the cafe with the, with the other older men. Mm -hmm. And when she was educating them, in like a paragraph on the problem, like with patriarchy or, you know, as far right. as the way in which we make a lot of assumptions and how things are supposed to be through the eyes of quote unquote men, right? And she was like, no, nah, that wasn't my husband. You know, it was like, I, and it, I, it felt very, like that was the most, it was very attractive, you know? Cause I was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Yeah. Did people have trouble I, read, reading it? I mean, because there's like really heavy duty stuff that happens too. Um, whenever the midwife came around, I would get like so anxious. <laughs> you know? So I was just like, um, and I did see some reviews that, you know, which you know, happen all the time that people say it's, you know, too painful or there's, you know, too much kind of violence going on there. Um, which is why I think the storytelling elements and kind of the agency uh, were so important to the story for kind of the hope that was needed. I don't understand why the mother let the midwife tell her how to treat her daughter. It seems so pain, you know, the mother inflicted such pain on her daughter on the midwife's advice. Mm -hmm. Why? That seems totally realistic to me when you have a collective society where, you know, there are these norms that, you know, and if you don't raise your daughter right, you know, you could be shamed, you could be shunned, uh, that there are those kind of expectations. Um, so I thought that was very authentic to kind of you know, even though you're in a refugee camp, you know, you're, you're bringing your, you know, you're bringing your social norms um, and trying to kind of survive in this society there. So. Um. I think um, Faith kind of going back to uh, the challenging and disturbing parts. Um, mm -hmm. and one of the things that I liked so much, just also kind of talking about what Ole said is just how real it felt and and how authentic it felt. And I think, um, you know, if we had read a, a novel about a refugee camp and there hadn't been some of those um, horrible moments, it, you would have questioned what, you know, how realistic a story it was. Right. Um, but the, the reality is most stories that you might read about a refugee camp would just be only that part. And right. it does such a beautiful job of making it feel whole and real and um, and just so multi-layered. I'm I'm just amazed again by like the simplicity of it, but how much he packed into that this very short book. Mm -hmm. I know, so short. But and then also the other thing I wanted to mention is about him not learning English until he was a teenager, and then to write so beautifully, right uh, in English um super impressive that's so impressive yeah yeah i know and to have been raised you know by you know in a by parents who were as he said couldn't read or write um but i mean having this strong oral storytelling tradition but yeah then having gone through that i mean i think he was two years old 
um, when his uh, that massacre and his father his father wasn't killed in the massacre but was killed as kind of the violence resulting from that. So he like grew up in a refugee camp, but grew up in this kind of liminal space of being half Eritrean, half Ethiopian, knowing that the civil war had like led to being displaced. And so then, you know, being in Sudan in two different camps, then following the mom to Saudi Arabia. And then by age 15, he thinks, uh, going to London and learning this new language. But having the love of literature start earlier with the banned books in Saudi Arabia, it's such an interest, it's such an interesting path. Um, and it just seems like by being quiet, maybe he was just like listening and taking everything in. It's kind of like those kids who are raised multilingual and they don't say anything. And then when they start speaking, they're like perfect in all the languages. It was kind of like that. Then you just like bust it out and like knew everything. Uh, so it's such an interesting trajectory to where he is. And I think the, the fact that he grew up in the refugee camp as the norm allows him to render in this way that's not kind of, oh, look at how tragic it is or look how other it is. It was his norm, uh, even though it was this liminal space. Um, so I think that really adds to the literature and something we've not seen before. Um, well, I, can I speak to the idea of the grandmothers? Sure. I, in, I know that uh, programs where they go in to try to stop uh, female circumcision, mm -hmm. have, there's such resistance in communities, but mostly it's from the women, the grandmothers, right. because they want their, their daughters and their granddaughters to be marriageable, marriageable, marriageable. Right. And uh, so the best, the most successful programs are when they go in and don't talk to the mothers where they go in and have programs to talk to the grandmothers, because mm. they're the ones that can make a change. And all that sexuality and uh, that kept going through, it kept reminding me about all those other women in the camp who were all cut and they right. didn't have that pleasure. And it was just so sad, I guess. I know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, and he, he just, I, I thought he beat it over our heads a little too much, but then it was so horrific to have happen to anyone that uh, then I got, got with it and said oh yeah it's okay for him to be that that strident about this because it really made his point it's, it's terrible yeah 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 indeed <coughs> yeah and it's definitely uh so much pressure like you can decide as a family that you don't want that for your daughter but then who is she going to marry what options will she have and so yeah, it is a kind of a longer term education. Than I have a happen. question. Does anyone know what they would think happens to her? Does she go and fight for the, on the Eritrean side? Oh. I almost asked him and I went, oh, that's such a junior high question. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I want to know. Right. <laughs> yeah, it does have this interesting ambiguity at the end. I mean, um, yeah. No, I'm mean, I very much concerned with love. Yeah, mm -hmm. I didn't see it as, as which side she would fight on. I thought of it in terms of taking the place of her friend's mother, and it and it linked me back to uh, the Shadow King book of just thinking of mm. these videos of women as warriors. So I kind of thought of it in a possibly sad. It could go any direction, but it also could be a possibly sad way of carrying on this. There's some kind of tradition of women taking up arms and fighting for whatever reason. And there are women on both sides and they're dying. And that's what I thought might happen. But, and as somebody who is a doctor, you know, I felt this like such an identification with her in a certain way of what one has to try to do to do it. And then all these different struggles and, you know, and now she's off in this total other direction. Mm -hmm. um, and the only other quick thing I wanted to say is I'm so grateful about this book because I had never really understood, I never read that much about Eritrea and Ethiopia. I didn't understand there was a conflict till the previous book. And now I realized, because I had said before, I grew up in the Washington DC area, a lot of Ethiopians. So it was like very, I'm now, this is Ethiopian, this is Ethiopian food, you know, but in Jira, these things, I, it, it's not just Ethiopian. Mm -hmm. And I've had many patients out here in the Bay area 
uh, and going to some, there's some Eritrean restaurants. Is this Ethiopian? And there's this funny look. No one ever explained what are the differences. They just let us go with our ignorant assumption that <laughs> it's a funny way of saying Ethiopian. That, that's how I thought until I read this. I said, wow, I'm so thinking, I've been, I've had, because I thought Amharic and Tigrinya were all Ethiopian languages. So it, this was so educational in that way. It's very interesting. And, the, and how Italian fits in, it goes back yeah. to their previous book of these thoughts of the roles of the colonizers and languages and very interesting. So thank you so much. I love this. Oh, thank you. Um, the uh, the uh, oh, okay. refugees from Sudan are in Uganda now in camps, and I'm happy to say Pamela is sending uh, about 52,000 books, we hope. Many of them are going to go to the areas with the camps for in uh, northern Uganda for oh, the wow. people who are refugees from the Sudan. Right. Right, and, right. Uh, just get shifted someplace else. Yeah. Right, but we are sending books there. Right. I do African Library Project. Pamela? You're muted. Yes. Kathy is my boss um, <laughs> the African Library Project. And yes, the print container is going to Uganda. You can find more information about our organization. We have a wonderful website. You look for African Library Project dot org and it's all one word so you can find out how to send books how to send money what we do thank you Kathy excellent so you'll be creating the future authors by providing books oh yes so, right <laughs> exactly great so we need to wrap up right um, some announcements from the museum. Sure. Um, thank you all so much for coming today. Um, and of course, I'm so grateful that um, Suleiman came and joined us. And I apologize. I think it was my fault that he was late. So um, luckily, he was on email and, and joined us right away. So that was <laughs> great. Um, we announced at the beginning of uh, the program what the November selection is going to be. Thanks, Ruby, for putting that in the chat. Uh, it's a book called His Only Wife. Um, it's kind of blowing up right now, so it'll be fun to read something that um, is getting a lot of attention. And um, we're going to be meeting a little bit earlier. Um, it will be November 22nd instead of the last Sunday of the month. It'll be the second to the last Sunday of the month to sort of avoid the uh, Thanksgiving weekend. And then we're going to skip December um, and we'll be back in January. But we have kind of a big book for January. Um, so we'll let you know <laughs> next month. Um, start reading it. <laughs> oh, tell us. Tell us now. Okay. It's called um, Triangulum. Um, do you remember the author's name, Faith? I don't know. It's South African. He's young. It's a crazy book. Is it is it up in the bookshop yet? It's not there yet, but that but we'll get it as soon as we can. Um and what else? We of course are very grateful for you being here and um we would love for you to support the museum. If you're able to, you can uh, donate by going to our website and uh, typing in, or you go to moadsf.org slash donate, or you can give by cell. You can text 56512 and type the word moadsf. Follow the link. Um, we also would love to get your feedback um, about this program. And if you have anything, messages that you want to send to Suleiman about today's talk, uh, and you can put it in the survey, and I will make sure that message gets to him. Um, so the QR code, you can take a picture of it um, with your phone, and then the, the survey will come up. Um, there's also a link to the survey. Um, which I'm hoping is in the chat. I don't see the chat right this second. It is. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so yeah, thank you all. Thank you, Faith. Um, thank you to everyone who read today. That was beautiful. Um, it was really fun. And uh, we will have the author with us 
next month again. And so we're going to do the early time again, noon to 1.30, because she's in England. Um, so I look forward to seeing you all next month. Thank you. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Good to see you all. Nice to see you, Peggy. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs>
that and yeah how she had left publishing because she was frustrated and so she wanted to have more control of you know as an agent and kind of getting the stuff out there that she wanted so yeah I've mm. had a lot of conversations about that trying to create more diversity in the publishing world through agenting like yeah there's a lot that needs to change and I think finally is changing in publishing um yeah. so yeah certainly exciting moment for at least African literature which we're we're here for that <laughs> mm -hmm. so. yeah well I'd uh yeah I'll definitely kind of keep track of <laughs> what you're doing and um and maybe join you again sometime um as a just a reader <laughs> so, thanks so much for coming yeah, yeah thank you got a great thanks, thank you for doing this <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah he's amazing i mean just it was it was really nice to get to i don't know hear him talk to the group and just kind of express himself as <laughs> um and uh yeah and i think it's a really exciting point um to kind of begin working with him um it'll be because most of my writers are actually even newer than he is um i mean chigozzi is kind of an exception but it's really great to be working with somebody who's kind of already on their way a bit more right. than someone who's just written their first book and yeah. so um yeah and yeah i love his voice and his ideas so Jessica, i don't know if you were on any of the emails that we were sending back and forth i think it was mostly great people but um i yeah email address in the chat so you know if you ever want to get in touch with me or um you know if you Thank have you. thoughts about if you have authors that you want to suggest we read then definitely let us know oh, i'd love to do that thank you so much um that's great um yeah yeah i'm i'm really excited about um What's ha I mean, African writers um, and uh, I think it's a really, I don't know, I've been in publishing for a long time, like more than 20 years and I feel much more, you know, excited and inspired about um, things that are happening in in publishing and the new writers that are coming through now than like <laughs> ever before. <laughs> and, I mean, certainly more than when I was just kind of getting involved in this uh, this industry. So that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, good luck, you all, and. Um, Stay well, and yeah. yeah, California's had a really hard year. I've been thinking about <laughs> people there. Yeah, and, uh, sounds nice right about now. <laughs> yeah. Well, hopefully, better times are ahead. Um. So yeah, great. Right. Nice for, to meet you. Thanks, thanks for you. coming. <laughs> thanks for coming. Bye. Bye. <laughs> That was funny. Yeah, that was I know. Nice. <laughs> that. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Yeah. Talk to you later. Oh yeah, actually, Nia, I um remember I'm gonna be gone Monday through Wednesday, so I'm not gonna be at either of the meetings. So okay. can. Can you just kind of report out about the different programs that happened in the past week? Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. All right. Sounds good. Right. Bye. Bye. Bye.